It's Brian Preston, the money guy. You know, there's a reason we tell you when you invest, don't invest anything in the financial markets that you can't be a long-term investor. Five to seven years is how long you have to be willing to let that money work. Well, guess what? Insurance companies know that rule as well. So that's why what they do is the way they can offer you these guarantees and these protections is they will control your behavior. Yep. They will put a surrender period on here that could last 10 years, mm -hmm. 12 years, 15, I mean, 15, 15 years. I mean, so let's kind of break into how these things and the limitations of an equity indexed annuity. Yeah. So the very first one, Brian, you just hit it. High surrender charges and cancellation fees. They control your behavior. They say, hey, sign on the dotted line and you're going to get this great thing. But if you want your money in the next 7, 10, 12, 15 years, you cannot touch it or you got to pay the piper. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that that's a big catch. That's a big – if that can control your behavior. Think about if I could have a client come in and I say, look, you give me this – because we can't use the word guarantee. But I tell people, historically, if you can leave the, the, the investments alone for five to seven years, we'll make it through the downturns. But I can't guarantee it. These guys can guarantee it because they're locking you down yep. for, for 10 years. And Love there it. hasn't been a time that the market's been invested on a, like a 60-40 diversified portfolio. That it, There's not a decade that you really lose money. That's exactly so that's right. how they can make promises like that. Uh, the next one is... Hi, this is what I, I, I don't mean to laugh. High commission fees. So oftentimes with these types of products, they are incredibly lucrative yeah. for the person selling it. That, um, that case I told you about, this is many years ago, but it was a 401k that was inherited, rolled into an IRA, put into an equity index annuity. I found out later that the commission on that product was 8%. Uh -huh. So you think about somebody who has $800,000 invested, 8% commission, I'm sure that guy, he, he, he definitely he your he had a tear a in his beer um, <laughs> after I pulled that commission back. Because that was, that was that's, that's pretty, that's crazy how high the commissions are on some of these products. The next limitation that we see is that we have expenses of the underlying investments. that They can be low-ish, some around half a percent, but some can even be greater than 2%. And this is on an annualized, ongoing basis, not that initial commission. These are ongoing expenses inside the underlying sub-accounts. Well, it's the structure. What they the way they will pay themselves these these high expenses is they'll be built into the participation rate, mm -hmm. the cap rate, because yep. they you won't see an actual cost on these equity index annuities. It's primarily going to be through the underperformance of the limitations that they build into the the, the asterisk, and yep. we'll explain more on that in just a second. And you you actually just hit that your return typically can't go below zero. That's that ratchet that they protect, but it's capped usually. Or we'll talk about a few different ways that they manipulate your return. To where you can only make, I don't know, 3%, 7%. Well, if you've ever watched our shows where we talk about what the market does, if you look at it on like a year-by-year -year basis, it's like up here, down here, up here, down here, up here, down here. But the average is fairly consistent over long periods of time. Yep. It just doesn't hit that average quite often. Well, if you are capping it at zero, that's great, but you're also losing a lot of that upside. So maybe what you're giving up might not be worth it. Well, a lot of people now see that part, you can't go below 0%. So you can't, can I not lose money on these investments? Yes, you can lose money because what happens if you have to, you had a medical issue. Now, a lot of these products will be written where you can get access to 5% per year, mm -hmm. potentially, but you might forfeit some bonuses and other things if you do that. But it's, it's still, they're going to limit your behavior. And if you do pull out above what they allow you to pull out in a year, typically like 5%, yeah. you're going to pay a large surrender That's fee exactly right. that you can actually lose money on these investments when you take into account the surrender fee. Now, one of the things that, that as we were kind of diving into this, that I thought was a little interesting, uh, these fees are, I mean, these, these uh, products are so easy to explain when you talk about the ratchet. But the way that they actually, and I'm going to use the word manipulate your return, is far from simple. It's not exactly easy. So we wanted to explain some vocabulary for you guys to be aware of, to understand, okay, if I'm being pitched a product, what does that thing actually mean? How are they affecting the performance that I can truly earn inside of these products? Well, and I think there's a clue in how they're designed too, is realize when we're talking about equity index annuities, these are not products that are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission yep. because they're not necessarily buying the S&P 500. Right. What you're, the dirty little secret that most people don't talk about. These things are regulated by your insurance commissioner, not the SEC. And then they perform, after we go through this list of all the fees and limitations, you'll find out they perform more like a fixed income guaranteed type product than they do 
the equity that they're tied to. Exactly That's right. more of a marketing ploy than it is on an actual performance, and we'll explain more. So the first one is just a cap. This is exactly what it sounds like. There's an upper limit on the return you can experience over a period of time. So, hey, yeah, you get market performance up until 7%, yeah. and then you don't get any more. Pretty, pretty straightforward. The next one is a participation rate. This is, you get a percentage of the index's return credit to your annuity. So maybe you get 60% of the return. So if the market makes 10%, you only make 6%. So what I think is interesting, because a lot of people are watching this and go, okay, so it must be an either or. So I either get you know 7% cap or I get at a 80% participation. So those years that like last year where the stock market's up well over 20%, mm -hmm. you're thinking, okay, well, that means that product will be capped at 7%. But if it was participation, maybe I just want the one that has participation, it's 80% of you know 20. Wow, that'd be great. No, these things are stacked. Uh -huh. So what happens is, think about this. If you had a cap of 7%, but then a participation of 80%, they stack these things on top of each other, each other. You'll have a year like we had last year where the market makes over 20%, and you're going to look at your return and go, that doesn't look anything like what happened yep. with the stock market because I hit the cap and the participation rate got em uh, employed. And then there's another fee, the spread margin asset fee. Some products are written where they'll say, we're automatically every year going to take 3% off of the performance yep. of whatever index is listed. These things get stacked on top of each other. And here's the other thing that's a dirty little secret. You would think, okay, if they get crushed on something, if we hit a downturn, can they change the rules after they've already designed this product? The answer is yes. Absolutely. All they, they have to do is they can go to the state insurance commissioner. It's easy for them to change the participation rates and other things after you've already had the contract written, which is usually not the greatest thing when you're talking about negotiations, mm -hmm. when somebody has all the cards and you're left holding the bag with what's left over. This next one, uh, this one kind of frustrates me because what I found in my experience, this is the hardest one to end up explaining to clients or potential clients is this bonus. It's a percentage of the first year premiums received that's added to the contract value. So let's say that uh, you uh, you buy a hundred thousand dollar equity index annuity. Well, they, they say you they know put what? a sweetener in there. I'm going to go ahead and give you a ten percent bonus, so it's actually worth a hundred and ten thousand yeah. dollars. Well, what they don't tell you is it's actually in most cases only worth that if you annuitize that benefit at some point in the future. You don't ever actually get that money back, at least from the policies that I've looked at the most. It's not really real. It kind of it's another one of those things that handcuffs you to where you feel like you can't get out of the well, product. See, they all they usually have a vesting schedule, yep. and the vesting schedule typically will be even longer than the surrender period. Mm -hmm. And you've already heard us talk about surrender periods can be seven to fifteen years. So if they put a vesting schedule on these bonuses, you, you have to look once again. It's great from the marketing as you hear. I'm going to get a guaranteed ten percent uh -huh. sweetener stacked on top of this as yep. a bonus. But then when you find out. That's over extended over the life of this product, and it's got a huge vesting period. Like that's not as good. Not I as mean, good if you start all. dividing that by the years that I have to keep this, all of a sudden, I mean, and when you take that into co coordination with the caps and the participation mm -hmm. rate, you realize it's, it's not really sweetening the deal as much as you thought. But it sounded good emotionally when you that's first right. heard the sales pitch. Uh, and then the last are just riders. These are extra features that can be added to an annuity for additional costs. So you can have life insurance riders or cost of living riders or fill in the blank. Once again, they do one of two things. They either increase the cost of the product or they decrease your potential return. So I know a lot of our, our audience is probably listening, oh, man, these guys, they're sounding more like professors, you know, textbook salesmen than they are the typical entertaining guys they are. So do, can they at least show me something? So can I get an illustration sure. so that I'm not just going off of these tables? When when we have slides with tables and lines and columns and rows, you're like, oh gosh, this is just like I'm in high school again or college. No, we want to show you, we actually put together an illustration to kind of teach this in a way that actually visually I think will make more sense. So let's see how uh, they actually stack up. Let's see how equity indexed annuities stack up to index funds. So let's assume you bought an equity indexed annuity in 1990 that just tracks the S&P 500, 500 yeah. biggest companies in the United States. And let's say that that particular product has a cap of 7%, right? You know, cap is usually somewhere between three to seven, but let's be generous. Say it has a cap of seven, but you can't go below zero. So uh, dot com bubble bursts, don't go below zero. Great recession, don't go below zero. COVID 19, 
don't go below zero. But there, the, here's something we didn't even put in here because I want people to know we tried to give the benefit of the doubt here. We put it at 7%, which is pretty generous. You don't see any participation rate. Remember, these things get stacked on top of each other. The fees get stacked. We didn't even put participation rate in there. Yep. We're just going to assume you get that first 7% is all yours to keep, even though we know in Reelsville's, that's not actually how things work. Reelsville? We, a right. Reelville. Another, hey, another T-shirt. Put that one on the list. I love it. We live in Reelville. Yeah, so. I love it. So, okay, so let's actually look at what the numbers look like. Okay, so the blue line on the chart, and if you're out there listening uh, on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, we're actually just showing the performance of the S&P. And just like we said, it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Some years it's as high as 30%. It looks like an EKG. Yeah, it, it actually does look exactly like an EKG. Well, in the middle, that kind of orange-ish line, yeah, it goes up to as high as seven, but it never goes below zero. So it's a nice steady band through time. So it's a much smoother walk. You're getting rid of the large palpitations of the S&P 500. And realize, once again, this is an annuity that the Money Guy team designed mm -hmm. that has not half of the limitations that you see typically with a normal product design, but we just wanted to use this as a teachable sure. illustration. So the question is, all right, well, which one came out better? Because, uh, Brian, I don't know about hard, you, but when I look at that, dot .coms... Nudie is looking pretty good. Well, Great look recession. at the Great Recession. I mean, that thing, it fell off a cliff. Yep. I mean, you look at those returns and you're like, wow. And by the way, this is, you know, diversified investing. You're not just buying the S&P 500. You're, you're doing right. like a more of a, probably a 60-40 or some type of diversification mix. But this does make a great example. It's hard to tell what the long-term performance is when you just look at the ups and downs of that S&P 500 mm -hmm. EKG there. So when we actually look at this, what's that, 20-year period, 19-year period? Nope, that's bad math. 30-year period. horrible math. That is, that is 20 times, 10, 30 zeros. years. Not, not my jam. All right, 30-year period, right? So we're talking about a long time period. On average, the annualized return of the S&P 500, 9.96%. How much did the guaranteed safety of that equity index annuity cost you? The annualized return was only 4.9% over that 30-year period. But wait, there's more. I mean, this is, this is the thing, because realize we didn't put participation rate right. in there. But there's another catch that people don't talk about when they're selling equity index mm -hmm. annuities is that dividends make up a large portion of your long-term performance when you're buying into the equity marketplace. Yep. Um, dividends you know, come from, you think about all the big companies, a lot of them issue dividends to their investors. Those get reinvested. When they get reinvested, that's essentially sweetening up sure. long-term performance. Well, there's actually been research mm -hmm. on that. And this is not just picking on the equity index. It's just thinking about how powerful are, are, are dividends to your long-term performance. Fidelity actually did some research on this. They looked at a period, this was for 20 years. They said, okay, now realize this ended as of 2018. So it does not have the outsized performance of 2019. Sure. It does not have the volatility of 2020 with the COVID-19. But this does show you kind of an interesting thing here is that the 20 years as of December 31st, end of 2018, Fidelity found that it was $21,577 is the S&P 500 return without dividends. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at it with total returns, meaning with dividends, the number bounces up to $31,000. So, Brian, I'm confused. We were just talking about equity index annuities, and then you went on the sidebar where you're talking about yeah. dividends. Connect those two dots for me. Well, equity index annuities just go off of price changes. And it depends upon how your contract's written. Some look at them from month-to-month -month price changes. Uh, you know, there's also annual price changes. It all depends upon how the contract was written, but they don't take into account dividends. It's only the price changes of the index that they're saying that they're tied to. And, and that's what I think there's a little asterisk down at the bottom of this slide. And this is a, an important point, too. This is not only just a recent effect. If you look at this, since 1930, dividends have made up approximately 40% of the S&P 500's average annual total return. So if you're just going off price changes, no matter whether you're looking at it monthly, annually, you're still shortchanging yourself on a lot of the long-term exactly performance right. here.